often we hear in our Christian lingo the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. Uh, we say that a lot, and we kind of know what we mean. In other words, we try to divorce the person from the, from the acts that they do. We still love the person even though they do wrong things. But I want to take a look at that. That is actually not found in the Bible anywhere. That little mantra that we say, love the sinner, hate the sin. Does anybody know who, who coined that phrase? Right up there, Gandhi. Okay. Um, came from a Hindu. Um, so let's just take a look at that here. Um, obviously, he was not a Christian. He had, had some very high moral convictions. Um, but is this a Christian phrase that we should live by? Is it something we should be saying? I just want to take a look at that here. And we're going to look a little bit at semantics, you know, the words we use and what's the meaning behind it. And see, does it line up with the word of God? So does, to, so does God love the sinner? Yes, he does. Does God hate sin? Yes, he does. Should we love sinners? Yes, we should. Should we hate sin? Yes, we should. Okay? So it seems kind of obvious that that's a really good little saying to live by. Uh, but let's take a look at that here. Let's start with the last part about hating sin. Okay? How many of you hate sin? Raise your hand. Okay? We all hate it, especially when it, we see it in the world around us, ruining people's lives. When it's towards us, we hate the sin. But sometimes, if we're honest, we don't always hate our own sin that much. I mean, to be honest, if we really hated our sin, do you think we would do it? If we really hated it. Now, I 100% hate any food that ever lived in the sea, or a river, or a lake. If it's seafood, a fish, anything like that, I absolutely hate it. Now, occasionally, I will join my family who all love that stuff. And take a little bite. I get dared to. I get manipulated to. I try it. But even if I try it, I hate it desperately. Okay? I know that I 100% hate fish. And I 100% stay away from it. If I can. Right? Because I absolutely hate it. So therefore I want nothing to do with it. But out of the kindness of my heart, sometimes I still try to set a good example and try it. Um, I 100% love donuts, okay? I mean, if there's a donut laying around and I have a chance to eat it, I will probably do it. This is something about me. Um, every time I go to a grocery store, even if it's my list says get this and that, I will try to at least walk by where the donuts are to look at them. I rarely ever buy them. Rarely ever do I. I rarely ever buy donuts, okay? <laughs> Because I know that I'll just sit there and eat one after another, okay? But, but I like to go by and look at them. Even if I don't eat them, I go by and look at them, okay? One of my little supermarket sins there. Um, because I love it. I love them. But I hate fish. And you know, if I 100% hated sin, then I wouldn't do it. But to be honest, I don't 100% hate sin. Now, after I do it, I usually hate it. And I swear I'm not going to do it again, and I'm going to try harder, and I'm going to... But if I really hated sin perfectly, then I wouldn't do it. But the problem is, I do not perfectly hate sin. God perfectly hates sin. He is holy, and he can hate sin. And we can at least claim we hate it, but to be honest, we make ourselves hypocrites when we say that we hate sin. Because if you're anything like me, and maybe I'm the only one in the room... We don't really hate our sin perfectly. That should be our goal. But Jesus, when he said in Matthew 7, 1 to 5, and people love verse 1, that says, do not judge or you will be judged. And they kind of leave it at that. So you don't have a right to judge anybody. But Jesus explains why we don't have a right to judge. It's because for in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. How many of us have really taken the planks out of our own eyes? It's still there. 
It's very impossible for us to get it out of our own eyes. And what we're told here, Jesus says, if you're going around judging other people in their sin, then you're being a hypocrite. Because they're going to turn around and say, well, but you're not perfect either. And kids love to have this little you know, dialogue with each other. And they're right. You know, and even as grown-ups, as adults, when we go judging somebody else for their sin, they can just turn around and say, but you're not perfect either. And so therefore, we end up putting ourselves under condemnation every time we judge somebody else. We are just as guilty. Maybe it's a different sin. Maybe we didn't abuse the kids and kill somebody and steal from the store, but we are guilty of our own sins. Sin is sin. Now, we've established the fact when I asked, does God love the sinner? He does. Does God, does God hate sinners? Well, there's a few places in his word that talks about this. Um, oh, first of all, though, when we talk about judgment, I'm sorry, I'm skipping over here some. Psalm 51.4, David, who had just committed adultery with a married woman, when he repented, he said, against you, he's talking to God, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are right in your verdict and you're justified when you judge. David said he had only sinned before whom? Before God. Um, of course, he had sinned before his people. He had sinned before this woman. He had sinned bef before his own wife. He had sinned to the husband of the wife that he was with. He sinned against everybody, but nobody had the right to judge him except for who? God. God is his only judge. God is the only one who is perfect in his judgment. And therefore, it excludes us being able to judge one another. So when God judges sin, he can do so rightly because he is just. Psalm 5.5, 5, it says, The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. Psalm 11.5, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. And we read these verses and we think, well, he's talking about Hitler and, you know, these kind of people, you know. But, but sin is sin to God. In Romans 5, 9 to 10, it says that all of us who are sinners are enemies of God and under his wrath. In our sin, when God sees us as sinners, we are his enemies. We are his enemies and under his wrath. Who wants to be under the wrath of God? What would that be like? We don't want to be under the wrath of God, but we are in our sinful state. From the time we were born and our sinfulness was inside of us, it made up who we are. And as we continue to live our lives and we still do these sins that we don't 100% hate, that's a part of us and we are under God's wrath and we are counted his enemies. I have here a glass of water, it's clean. I could drink it. I also have a can of the super lubricant. Okay? It says on here, harmful or fatal to swallow. It. So if I open up my mouth and squirt it in my mouth, that's probably not a wise thing to do, right? But let's say I just put a little tiny squirt in this cup. Okay? okay? There's just a little bit in there. Can I drink it now? Would you advise me to drink it or not to drink it? You know, the whole water is contaminated, even though I just had a little sprinkle drop of something poisonous inside of it. And all of us, no matter, even though we aren't Adolf Hitler or Charles Manson, we are all have at least a drop of sin that contaminates who we are in God's eyes. And that drop of sin, whether it's a big drop or a little drop, and we judge ourselves and we like to compare, but God says we've sinned. We've all sinned, we're his enemies, and he, we are under his wrath. Um, the great thing about God is that even though he hates sinners and he can do that perfectly because he's just and holy and he has the right to do that, he also can love perfectly all the sinners. And so it's true. God does love sinners. Even though he hates us, he loves us. Because we read in Psalm 36, 5, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness 
to the skies. God's love is so big. You know, I love this verse because when you go out and you look at the big skies and this verse comes in mind, it's like, that's how big God's love is. It goes on and on and on forever. It surrounds me and everybody around us, the whole air around us. Hosea 14, 4, God says, I will heal their waywardness. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away from them. Even though we are under his wrath, in his love, he wants to turn away from his anger towards us, even though he has the right to do so. Jesus taught his disciples, including us in Luke chapter 6, 27 and 28. He said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus is not telling us to do something that he himself hasn't done himself. God has loved his enemies. He has done kind, good things to those who hate him. He's blessed those that cursed him, and he's prays for those that have mistreated him. When Jesus was on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. I mean, that's powerful words to come from a person who understands what it is to love the object of their hate. And it seems like contradictions. Okay, so does God hate us or does he love us or does one, one equal the other out? And if we try to comprehend it, it kind of boggles our brains. I can't do it. But both are true. He hates us, but he loves us. And that love overpowers and turns into a gift of salvation that comes for us. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Despite the fact of our sin, despite the fact of God's wrath, his love comes into play. We love to tell people God is love. God loves you. We don't like to tell people God hates you because you're a sinner. I mean, that's really kind of rude and that's nasty. And, but the Bible tells us that is the truth. And if we don't understand that God hates us and our sin, then we don't understand the power of his love. It's not like God is some Santa Claus up there that just loves everybody and brings gifts to everybody at Christmas time. There is a break between us and God. But God, through his love and mercy, sent his son to be the bridge to take away that gap in between us. To say that God hates sinners, that's true. To say that God loves sinners, that is true. Because God is perfect in his hate and he's perfect in his love. To say that I hate sinners or hate sin and love the sinner, I can't do that. Because I don't, I'm not God. I don't have perfect hate and perfect love. And and while we're maybe going through a fine line here, when we say to people who are sinners, well, I love you, but I hate your sin, how are they receiving that? They don't differentiate the two the way that we would because they see that it's one and the same. And what they're seeing is, well, you then, well, then, you, know, well, then you hate me. And you ask anybody who you know, hears people say that to them that are in the sinful mode, they're going to say, I feel judged. And so I would encourage us to love the sinner, period. Sin and all, just like God loved us, sin and all. It doesn't mean we approve. It doesn't mean that we endorse it. But we just love them, sin and all. All of their bruises and stains and their dirtiness. You know, it doesn't matter if they just crawled out of the mud puddle. We welcome them on our lap. We don't care that our clothes get dirty. We don't care that they stink. We don't care that their sin is disgusting to us. We put our arms around them, sin and all. There's just a great story in the New Testament, and I referred to this a few weeks ago in John chapter 8. Jesus, I'll just paraphrase it here instead of reading it all. These religious Pharisees brought this woman caught in adultery to Jesus. And they said, okay, are we ready to stone her? What do you say about this, Jesus? And Jesus says, how many of you have not sinned? If you have no sin, then go ahead and throw the stone. Now, God's law in the Bible, it actually says, if you commit adultery, the punishment is death by stoning. I mean, God even said that. But Jesus overrides that and says to those people, but it's not your job to punish her because you have sin in yourself as well. And those men put down their rocks. 
Because even though they, they were proud, the fact that they were such good, holy people, they knew deep down inside that they could not judge her. Jesus teaches us a new way. In John 3.16, we love that verse, and I've mentioned this before, about how God came to the, love the world to us and that we would believe in him and not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. But then, the very next verse, John 3.17, says, Jesus said, I didn't come in the world to judge the world, but to save the world. We live in a time where judgment is being suspended. Judgment is being held back. Even Jesus himself didn't come to judge when he was here. And he's taught us, his disciples, his followers, saying, you don't judge either. Just love the way that I love. Again, it's going to be hard for us to tolerate sin. It's going to be hard for us to not speak out against it. And there's an appropriate time and way to speak out against it. I'm not negating that. And that's a whole other sermon right here. But when it comes to our attitudes, to hate the sin means that we're hating the sinner and we're building walls between us and we must be careful of that. Jesus said to this woman that came to him, he said to her, then I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. He kept his standard, but he did it in love. And when there's sinners out there, that should be our acceptance as well. We love you. We don't condemn you. We want you to know the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And God uses us as instruments to be able to share that. And as we do that, then it might break through the sin. It might break through their hardened heart. It might open up some cracks to where they get to see the reflection of God's love through us to them. And that's the standard that Jesus has set for us. And there's always what ifs. Well, what about this? What about that? Should I let my kid do this? Should I let this, you know? There are a lot of ifs, ands, and buts. But when it comes down to it, we love the sinner. We love the sinner. And all of us can grow in that, in loving the sinner. May God teach us how to be able to love them the way, the perfect love that he has shown to them as well. When we take the communion here, the bread and the cup. We pay attention to our own hearts. You know, if there's any judgmental attitudes that we have, if there are, there's their condemnation, sometimes, we, sometimes we, we judge ourselves. Sometimes we're so hard on ourselves. And we don't even give ourselves the same sort of grace that God's given to us. Maybe you need to direct it to yourself. Maybe you need to direct it to somebody in your life and say, God, I really need to know what it is to love this person in my life. Even though they're wayward, even though they're wrong, even though their lives go against the principles that God has set and what I have for myself, and it goes against what our community believes or our church believes, can we still love that person with an overwhelming love that would at least give them the opportunity to know the love of Christ and leave their wicked ways? Let's not build up walls that pushes them away. And as we come here today, let's examine our hearts and think about the love of Christ that extends in beyond ways that we can ever comprehend.